I'm Dr. Lizinla Schaefer, and I level the playing field of knowledge around wellness, medicine, and research to help you to make informed decisions. Welcome, welcome to the Doctor Connect, where we are connecting through inspiring stories and providing education and information around wellness, health, cancer, medical technology, and leadership. I'm your host, Dr. Lyudmila Schaefer, medical oncologist broadcasting from Kansas City in the United States. All information discussed on this platform does not substitute your medical care. Guests on this platform share your own stories, experiences, and conclusions. And I would like to acknowledge her story channel to bring you the Doctor Connect. And today, we have a pleasure to have a very special guest, Glenn Gardner. He is the president of Gardner Innovation, Search Partners, a related executive search firm specializing in assisting organizations worldwide to recruiting technology transfer, intellectual property licensing, commercialization, venture development, and innovation professionals. But most important, there are so many other things we would like to learn today because our special topic today, the mindset in leadership and diversity. Welcome, Glenn, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. I, I feel honored and I'm looking forward to chat with uh, yourself and your audience. Well, it is uh, our pleasure and uh, I've been very excited since May because a lot of new changes been recently in concept of leadership, in concept of diversity. And we are going to dive deep in so many valuable topics. But I would like for you, can you please start? Tell us your name, your full name, uh, where you located, as well as a little bit of your story. Perfect. Um, I'm Glenn Gardner. Um, I'm a headhunter. You can call me an executive recruiter, headhunter, whatever you like. Um, we just recently moved. Um, we sold our house in Columbus, Ohio, and we moved to our cabin in the Mohican State Forest. So you're looking at my basement, which is now my new uh, home office. And uh, we're, uh, we're, we're, we're tethered with, uh, with a cell phone to the Internet because there's no, no Internet out here. I'm hoping Elon Musk gets his Starlink uh, going here pretty soon. Um, for the past, um, I've been recruiting for the past 23, 24 uh, years. The past 18 of those have been recruiting um, in the innovation space, more specifically um, recruiting the people that commercialize intellectual pro property out of research institutes, hospitals, universities, national labs. And I've had the uh, great honor to, to actually work all the, all, all the way around the world, mostly in the United States, but, but also in the Middle East, uh, Australia, and um, I've spoke on careers in technology, commercialization, tech transfer in China and, and, uh, and in Turkey. Uh, that's so overwhelming, but also I will tell you that's because I'm doctor and the beauty of our conversation today, because you and I, we are coming from different worlds. We are coming from different occupation. We come in from different experiences. And there's so much, and I feel like we have the same thing. We have the same goal to make world better and see how we can help audience and how we can have people out there that basically sit at home, sit on a couch, or maybe looking on their phone and think, that's not me. And my goal today, how can we bring everyone so anybody who sits out there, they feel like, oh, it's related. I can be part of conversation. And they don't feel that's not me. And I would like to start from see how we can make things united. For example, I grew up on the border of Poland and Belarus. 
and I came over here about 20 years ago. And back in the days, cancer field and oncology field was mostly men dominant field. And recently, things changed. Right now, over 55% admission to medical school are females. So it's changing. However, in the corporate world, we are still not there. We are still catching up. So I would like to ask you, what does the leadership means to you? Hmm. So um, I guess for, for just a little background on, on the, the male-dominated oncology, my, my wife's a lung cancer survivor. She's seven years out. She's doing very good, except for uh, on her bike ride today, she fell over and she scratched her elbow and her knee, but we'll take that all day. Um, zero doctors of hers were, were, were female, zero. And, and, and she, gets, she gets opinions from Ohio State, from uh, the Cleveland Clinic, and then Dana-Farber, where I placed innovation professionals. Uh, we actually went out there too, because she has kind of a, a rare form of she had a rare form of lung cancer. So when you're in the, in the innovation field, you want to get the most innovation thing. And the other thing, the other uh, discriminatory or reverse discriminatory is I'd say of the nurses that we've seen, I'd probably say only 5% of the nurses were, were male. So hmm. I think, I think that's a big gender gap that we need to look at too. So going back to your question, um, what is leadership? Um, I can't consider myself a, a super great leader myself um, because I run, I run a very small search firm. And frankly, my, my people are all smarter than me, thank God. So I guess that attests to good leadership. So you should always hire people that are smarter around you. And I, I really have been very lucky to do that. You're uh, very humble. Well, it, it, it's, um, I kind of stumbled into this technology transfer recruiting by accident, but once I realized how niche it is and how I'm the only person in the world that does it, I've really dug dug my heels in and became, you know, world, world, worldwide in doing that. So we're tasked to find leaders in technology commercialization offices. So um, some searches that we've done, we've placed the leader at Duke University, Ohio State University, um, Augusta, uh, Augusta Medical School uh, in Augusta, Georgia. The, the list goes goes on and on. We're currently recruiting for a little school in Boston called MIT. Yeah. So what, what we like to do when, as a recruiter, we don't, we, we can't pick the best person. It's our job to pick what we find are the best between seven and 10 people. And then we present that to the search committee and then the search committee has to figure out which one they like and which one fits in from a cultural standpoint, the best from their standpoint. So I can't say that, that, that I'm, I'm the world's best at picking leaders, but I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. The shift that I've seen in the past probably four years very, very much is this, is, is this shift towards diversity recruiting. Mm. And it, it's, I think for my first 20 years in business, it was lip service. People are like, well, we need diversity. And they, they kind of turn their head the other way and mm -hmm. they don't really care. But, but now it's, it, it, it's front and center. Um, and, and our clients are pushing us harder and harder. And from a recruiting standpoint, we've actually had to do a lot more stuff with tracking our metrics. Um, to give back to, to the people. And, and when they say, hey, why don't we have mm -hmm. more women in the pool? Why don't we have more people of color? Why don't we have more, you know, Latinos? Um, we can actually, we're actually tracking these metrics that we can give them and say, hey, you know, we reached out to a thousand people. And, and of that, um, only 32% were women because because of the, the field, they're, they're, they're truly not that many. And, and it'd be interesting to see if you went to your mm -hmm. American Oncology Association, whatever that is, they, they track these metrics themselves. It'd be interesting for me to know, because I don't know your industry, what would be the metrics of, okay, of all the oncologists, not just 
colorectal oncologists, but all the oncologists in the country, how many of those are women? Do you, do you know that number? Uh, I do know not. I do not know the number specifically because it, it is very changing, and also a lot of numbers. It's very difficult to identify because how the registration done and how also you know someone you know step forward, and it's very very difficult to measure. I know that it has been growing. I know certain numbers of admission. But right now in oncology, it's very difficult to say, but we do see other metrics, for example, uh, not shifting conversation, but the survey was done and was actually uh, published by uh, women. It was identify how physicians are dressed. And that's probably lead to our next question. For example, at the conference, if it's a woman, it could be called by first name, but if it's a man, it's always a doctor. Even I experience in the clinic, I can be sweetheart and honey and Ludmilla, but if it walks man, the conversation completely different. Mm -hmm. So I think this also play a role that how we perceived as professional, as leader, you know, if I am 115 pounds <laughs> and uh, I still look sort of younger, I'm not probably, you know, seen as a person. So there are also different shift. One, like you said, is the true metrics, but also how people step step forward to be in these metrics. Interesting, interesting. And once again, I think a good thing to do would be to talk to your professional association of, you know, I don't know how narrow your association goes, but I'm sure there's a colorectal association of, of oncologists or just the, the United States. Um, professional associations are very valuable. And yeah. in, in my business, I'm very partnered with the Association of University Technology Managers. It's called Autumn. And so I, I really lean on them for, for metrics because they, as they get their dues, there's check box, boxes. You can obviously, um, you don't have to apply, but I, I think I think it'd be interesting to see those metrics. And and those metrics are becoming uh, a lot more popular today for, for, for all the reasons we're discussing. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I had a communication with uh, one of the uh, presidents from uh, American uh, Society of Clinical Oncology. And actually, they are very much right now into move and uh, toward helping women. There are also special research grants Right now, uh, there are you know, women also presidents of our society. So things changing dramatically. But all of this, as I personally see, and I can't speak up for every single woman in the country or oncologist, it's still not there. And we still have some women not able to get to corporate positions or become chair of the department or even be invited to serve on the board. And uh, I don't know what it would take me to be served on the board. Sometimes, oh, it's your credentials or it's that or it's that. It's always some sort of question. So we are trying to find ways, what from your situation, how women could, what they could do to show up and show themselves that they can be in those metrics. Um, this my my business partner her name is Lisa Rooney. Um, she, she has a twenty year career in technology transfer before she came over, and um, I was trying to recruit her to a position, and uh, she says, "You know, I'm sick of running technology transfer office at universities," and like like a dummy, I says, "Well, why don't you be a recruiter?" Because she wanted to travel the world with her husband. And then being a recruiter is a very mobile, mobile position with an internet connection and a phone. You can work anywhere in the world. And a couple of years ago, she was she was in uh, Avignon, France, working just just as the same as normal. But um, what we had a discussion the other day, and, and she, she does some volunteer work with the Sierra Club, and, and they were discussing that um, there's a trend, and, and we're kind of seeing this that 
on a job posting, let's say that you see a job posting uh, in, in your, in, from your professional association or on LinkedIn or whatever, or at your university for, you know, chair of whatever, whatever the job posting is. She says that the trend that she's seeing, and I'm seeing it too, is men, let's say there's, let's say the man only, only can check out of the five check boxes, maybe the man only checks three, going to apply anyways. <laughs> yes. And, and what Lisa said, and I agree with her, she says that what she's seeing is that women won't even apply. So, Correct. you know, it, it, and, and once again, I'm not trying to, I know these things are kind of delicate situations coming from a, a white male, but, um, you know, unless the women checks all, all five boxes, they're not even going to apply. And so Thank on the other side, yeah. what's that? I said, thank you for saying this. Is, 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 do you agree? Uh, yes, so, I agree. So what, what I'm saying is, from a recruiting standpoint, we want to see your credentials. You know, we want you to apply and we want to be the ones to tell you, hey, you know, our client really, really wants these two other check boxes. So we're going to throw you back, back in the in the ocean till you grow a little more, you know, but we're going to treat you professionally regardless but we really want to see you stretch and, and apply even if you don't check all the check boxes because who's to say which are the most you know important things so i think that and and then the other uh issue that that Lisa and i have been discussing is the trailing spouse is, issue you know mm -hmm. most doctors well, well in, in my field the people i i place are typically phd mbas PhD JDs and PhD MBA JDs. So I, I, I recruit some very, very intelligent people and they're typically married to another very, very intelligent person, you know? So I don't know if, 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 if your significant other is, is a doctor or has an advanced degree, but it's very common. So, so the trailing spouse issue is, is another big issue that, that we get because a lot of the times, you know, that the person's spouse, although I, I recruit in the tech transfer world, the spouse may be a, a principal investigator at a university or maybe they're in pharma and drug development or, 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 or whatever. So um, and then and then whose career is going to take precedence. So these are all issues that we deal with daily. Yes, and it's very valid point because there are some men that they can just basically stand the, when the woman more successful, and uh, you know something I experienced uh, personally. But also there are different aspects. I want to step back for a minute, like you said about check boxes, and uh, we hear a concept that they say, well. You know, maybe women, they just not so confident and they just don't have that self-esteem and they don't step forward. But I would disagree sometimes because actually when a study was done and it was published that in oncology, like women, we have a national cancer guidelines. It's a national cancer guidelines. And the physician oncologists, they more adhere to guidelines and they more adhere to rules. They more actually, they treat the patient, they follow so strict rules. And I'm not saying that, man, they do, you right. know, obviously a very diligent job, but it's just interesting how the studies show and guidelines, we always say guidelines are guidelines and uh, it's just guide, but we have to go with personalized treatment. But also there are some other studies done when women actually do, uh, physician notes, they stay longer, they fill out the boxes longer. So how do we find this balance that if woman feels that if I don't qualify to check five boxes, I kind of lower my self rank, I put three boxes and I do. And what if they start feeling, oh, I can just apply, I don't have to check all boxes. How do we find that balance? With that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. I, it's so. Uh, that it's one's so above. Weird. That one's above my 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 pay grade. Um, <laughs> you know, no. I, I, I I really don't know, but but this is why we we want to recruit a diverse group because it, it, yes, because you know, 
there's just different seats at the table. And, and what I realize is my wife just doesn't see her oncologist. It goes back to the tumor board. That's what I've learned about being a, in the patient as a caregiver. Um, and I don't know all, all the people that are at this tumor board that's discussing my wife's lungs. And so I want a diverse group of people on the end because they're going to see things from a different way and they may have, you know, what I, I, I think that, um, you know, what, what I've seen is, is, is this diverse background. It, it, it's been proven time and time again, that mm -hmm. if you, if you hire a diverse team, that you're going to get much better results. So that that's what I'm looking at. So I, I don't, I didn't answer your question. I dodged your question. Cause I, I really didn't, I, I, I really mm -hmm. don't, don't know the answer. You, you, you did answer, and I'll tell you why, but before I do this, Glenn, uh, my sincere sympathy, and I hope uh, your wife does well, and thank you so much for sharing such a vulner vulnerable story. It is not easy to discuss, and especially when we speak on a such topic, how leadership, so thank you so much for sharing, and we really, we all wish that your wife, everything go smooth, and she has all innovative treatment and if not then the most uh, perfect smooth surveillance follow-up so it, thank it, you it, it's just surveillance now so she's she's yeah. doing well and so you know Ex everybody from dana farber ohio State, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. your phone yeah excellent no 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 problem yes thank you so much for saying this but why i'm saying that you did answer my question because that's what I was leading to. If we actually hire diversity, we will be able to measure and find out why women don't check, like check three boxes and don't apply for the position. Why they have three years experience. It's okay. Maybe sometimes you don't have to have, you know, Five. nine years of experience. Correct. So, uh, that's probably, do you think that makes sense? A a a absolutely. From a recruiter standpoint, um, we just, we're, we're just, I don't know how to ask my candidates, you know, we, we, we say, Hey, you know, we're, we're, we're equal opportunity employers and we, you know, we want to hire diverse fields, but, but we, when we send out the, the email and leave a, a voicemail with the people, you know, I, I, I can't control the things from there. I'm just trying to give people very um, compelling reasons to you know, apply. And it's what's important to us is the clients we work with. And, you know, recruiting for universities like MIT, that, that, that's a real, you know, benefit because then a lot, a lot more people will, but um, maybe they'll be intimidated by it too. Yeah, and that brings us to a uh, concept. So one of the concepts that I really admire and I would love to get your opinion uh, from Bob Chapman, it's a human leadership that when he speaks about at the end of the day, when employee or you know anyone who works for any organization or for someone, when they go home ultimately, they are mothers and fathers and sons and daughters. And by having them being valued and cared at work, it actually brings them more joy and a better quality of life with the family. So that concept of human leadership and everybody matters really important to me. And I wonder what's your opinion? Well, uh, and it you know, I'm, I'm here. You, you've got you've got an MD. You've got to specialize in oncology. I mean, I'm 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 just I'm just a recruiter. I've got I've I was in the Navy in the nuclear power program. I have a mail order degree. You know, for, from a from a school basically. No one's ever asked me for for my my degree. So I, I have this very narrow skill set. And everyone I deal with is a PhD, MBD, JD. I mean, it got one of the guys I recruited. He was president of his college of his college. Uh, class. He had, a G he had a JD from Notre Dame and he was just finished his MBA from Wharton. So it it's like I'm dealing with these bright, bright people, but but I provide this crazy service called headhunting in this narrow, narrow space. And I become the, my, my firm's become the world leader in this little tiny niche. So 
you know, it's, but, and the way I look at things is at the end of the day, we're all the same, right? You want to go out to a nice dinner with your partner, or you want to go on vacation to a nice sandy beach. We all put our, our pants on one leg at a time and, and you want to be treated professionally. And I want to be treated professionally and at the end of the day. That's how I view my job. You know, even if when I'm dealing with these candidates, what I tell people is you may not get the answer you want to hear from me, but you'll get an answer yes or no. And you'll always know where you stand. And that's and, and I'm going to treat you professionally so that, that that's my mission. That's how I lead this firm. You know, I always say when, when, when I'm, I'm doing a search, what I always say in, in my business, if you just return your emails, you return your phone calls, you get up every day and you work for your, thank goodness in my field, only six to eight hours, you probably have to work 12. I'm sorry about that. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, if you just return your, your voicemails and you tell people where they stand, good, bad, or indifferent, you'll have a very successful career. So one message uh, for, you know, women who are listening to us right now, what would you recommend? So we return emails, we polish CV, we don't have to check five boxes. We can check four. Let me rank, let me put a little bit higher standards. So who is listening to us, they know they still have to work. And uh, can you give us maybe three tips for women that are hearing us right now? Yeah, um, I, I, I still say... Get active with your professional association. Okay. So, because your professional association, you'll be dealing with other peers and everyone will be seeing that the same issues, you know, you're working with. And then, then you start to learn who the leaders are in the association and then volunteering. So my, my wife's an association professional. So, she said, Glenn, you need to get on the board for the Ohio Association of Executive Recruiters. It's a lot of work. You know, it'll be a time commitment. But what you get out of it, you'll put in a lot, but you'll get out three times as much as, as you put in. So I did that. I was on the board for, for three years and, and I just learned a tremendous amount of things that there was a, a peer recruiter of mine. And he taught me about, he, he used to send out a questionnaire to all of his candidates. It was like four questions. And, and, when, and, and I've implemented that into my recruiting practice because before, you know, I'd interview a client and I would have to do this write up and I'm a terrible writer. So how can I write up? So now we have these very in-depth questionnaires that we give to our, our candidates, but who's best to sell yourself? You, right? So, so these questionnaires that we give, you know, it, it would be like, you know, why are you interested in this position at ABC Healthcare or what, whatever it was, but the client us work with it together. And then in the interview process, the, 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 the client doesn't need to ask all these basic things because they've already read it. And it shows their, the other thing it does when we're recruiting, it shows their commitment to recruiting, to, to applying for the position and it also shows their writing style. And that's very important. Communication via written is one thing. And then when they, they do their phone interview either or their, their phone interview or Skype interview or in-person interview, that's that's when they'll find all this other nonverbal things. I don't know if I answered yeah. your whole question. I, I kind of, I may have put it off on yeah. a little tangent. No, it's very important. Um, I strongly believe that uh, volunteer and participation in professional organizations and go a little bit outside the box. And sometimes it's very difficult because if person works for a certain uh, organization in a certain uh, you know, department or you know company, whatever we want to call at this point, how do you make up your time? Because then you have to have certain meetings and commitments and you have to ask your employer actually can i take this time off or you do for um expense of the family which is you know it's okay and it brings us everybody has a different goal and everyone in a different lifestyle if someone has 
small children, it's probably time to take care of the family. Right. And, um, you know, when they go to college, maybe that's what your opportunity to shift. And I sort of believe that finding that balance and apply yourself that one size doesn't fit all. Just because someone has conversation or like you said, six letters after your name or not, or has a certain corporate position and has a title, title, I believe, not always makes you a leader. And it's also applicable, what's your personal situation? What you would like to do today or five years from now or 10 years from now? Or maybe your goal change. Maybe today you want to do that and tomorrow you switch to different occupation or you know, entrepreneurship or organization. But the valid concept, what Glenn, you brought up, that get outside the box, get know your leaders. I want to tell one, share one example that one friend of mine shared with me. And uh, she told me, uh, you don't have to talk to your boss directly all the time. You can just go directly and speak to the senator, whatever you want to say. And <laughs> interesting concept that direct boss, it's, is it always how it's supposed to be that hierarchy? How do you approach this hierarchy and how do we, you know, act and, you know, for women or men out there, is it still important to go to your direct bo boss or sometimes we can jump and put our issue out there? <laughs> so, you know, that, that I, I'm going to take your question and put it into my recruiting world. So, <laughs> so that, that I, I live by this, this saying, it's, it's kind of cliche, but there's no traffic on, there's no traffic on the extra mile. Right. And so, how many times, so how many levels at your hospital are you below the CEO of the hospital system? Four or five? Yeah, there are multiple levels and uh, I am not coming right now from organization. So I have to be very genuine, discuss right. that, right. but uh, yes. So, mm -hmm. so what, what, what I realized for my first 17 years in business, I was recruiting to... I was selling to the director of technology transfer and, and what, and then after talking to my business mentor coach, what I realized is I was selling one level below. So in a university, it, it typically goes the president of the university or the, you know, the, the, the head guy, maybe the provost and then the vice provost for research. And typically about, 85% of the time, the director of tech transfer reports to the vice provost for research. And so my mental comfort level was talking to the tech transfer person, the director of tech transfer. But guess who writes the big checks? The vice provost for research. So, so it took me 16 years to learn this stuff. So my mental capacity or my mental comfort zone was only the director of tech transfer. And, and so with this, I got a lot of worker bee searches. I mean, I, I did well, but, but what I didn't get is these executive leadership searches and chief innovation officer searches like I did for Duke University, you know? And so I want to, and the bigger the search, the more I get paid. So if I did you know, seven leadership searches a year, that would pay me two and a half times what it would do if I placed 15 worker bees. So I had to get out of my mental comfort zone to go to the correct leader. So, and once again, it, when it comes to, let, 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 let's say for example, you know, you, you needed to move to Boston. Um, you know, so sh should you call the director of oncology uh, in at, um, at 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 Harvard Medical School? You know, what what if you what if you send a personal note because you can find the person's name and email address at, at the, the CEO of Harvard? Yeah. You know, and you can say, 
you know, dear Dr. So-and-so, you know, it looks like we both, you know, came from Belarus, you know, make it personal. And, 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 and he, they don't get these lead. I mean, how many times do you get a personal thank you note or do you get a personal note that says, you know, I'm in, I'm, I'm in uh, medical school at so-and-so. I want to be a gastrointestinal, blah, blah, blah. I, I'd love to, to shadow you. I mean, how many of those emails have you ever got directly? None, well, two? I, I will tell you that in the past, actually, we did get, and uh, people were even writing note. And I personally, when I even, you know, apply a long time ago, yes, we personally handwritten note. But in nowadays, absolutely not. And in nowadays, it's all pre-populated. So I think you brought a very, Glenn, important point. We have to be, you know, very personable. Just because we are having, you know, Zoom interview or whatever that computer thing right now, even on all platforms, there is a person on the other side, right? And so, if, if you really want to get to the person, yes, could, could create create a very nice, well written piece and send it FedEx with signature. Yes, FedEx with signature. That I, is I a. Mean, it, 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 he'll get it, and you'll get a response. I can, you want me to give you a, a funny story about this? When, when I did, a re, it was a long time ago. I was recruiting for, 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 for Bank One. So Bank One uh -huh. is now J.P. Morgan Chase. So um, I was just a, one of a, an army of probably 20 recruiters. So this guy, so, so this guy sends an email to this chief information officer for Bank One. The chief information officer of Bank One was probably a, a $5 million position, right? He, I mean, his name was Austin Adams, very, very high level. So, so I saw the email, it went from this network administrator, this $45,000 a year network administrator to Austin Adams. And it went from Austin Adams to my, the VP of recruiting. And then that email went to 20 different recruiters, everybody. And so I didn't know if this was Austin Adams nephew. <laughs> I didn't know, right? So do you think I called this? This guy had nothing to do with the field I was recruiting for. I called him. I interviewed him. I sent the results of the interview back up to my boss, Brian Moore. It's called re getting referred down the food chain. Yeah. Did that help? Yes, it does. It does. I mean, that's an absolute truth. I couldn't make that one up, right? Yes, yes. That's why we always have to be very careful. And luckily, actually, right now, um, you know, the, the world sort of we able to speak about it and we able to laugh. But when you get in this situation, I bet it's not funny at all. <laughs> yeah, it was just I, I just knew I, I had to. I didn't know if he was Austin's nephew or kid. <laughs> I, I didn't know. So I just treated him professionally. I interviewed him, told him he wasn't a fit for my department. Sent the yeah. results back up to my boss, and he sent it up to Austin Adams. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you, Glenn. So with that, we're just going to make two seconds break uh, before we switch to a different topic. Uh, once again, everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. Today we have our special guest, Glenn Gardner. And we are enjoying to discuss the conversation in the leadership. And I never thought that actually conversation in the leadership can be so enjoyable. So we will be right back. Thanks. I'm Dr. Lizinla Schaefer, and I level the playing field of knowledge around wellness, medicine, and research to help you to make informed decisions. All right, so we are back. We are back at the Doctor Connect, where we are connecting through inspiring stories and providing education and information around wellness, health, cancer, medical technology, and leadership. And uh, with that, we would love to continue our conversation 
with Glenn Gardner. Glenn, thank you once again for being here. We are learning so much about leadership and uh, different values and how women should apply to uh, expand themselves, answer emails, calls, um, expand your professional leadership, identify what's your faith. And now I also would like to share for the conversation, we have um, movement. It's a lot of women right now, established medical organizations, professional organizations, groups, book clubs, you just name it. And uh, I have not recently actually heard that there is a men organization or men's book club. And I'm sure that I have been, and you probably experienced that more than I have done. But can you tell a little bit where we, what we can do so the men don't feel that they're abandoned right now in all this movement? Well, that, 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 that's a touchy question for me because I, I truly feel there's reverse discrimination going on right now against men. I'm seeing it from my seat as a recruiter because my clients are pushing so much for, for women. And um, I, I you know, thank goodness my, my business partner, Lisa, is, is <laughs> she's the face with, with our clients. Um, and, and she's a little bit more uh, diplomatic than, than I am. But, but I, I, it's a very touchy situation right now. Um, I feel that some of my clients have taken this too far. Um, I had one client, they, they only wanted people of color. And they said that. And I, I didn't, I, I didn't think that was right, but I, 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 I shut my mouth and then we found them a, a great gentleman, a person of color. Um, but, but I think they, they, they um, at the end of the day, I want to present great people and I want to let them select, but, but it's my job to include a diverse slate of candidates. So I, I, I think, I think the pendulum has shifted very far right now. And I'm just doing all, all we can do to, to keep that. Um, I, yeah. I, I, I have, we, we, I personally have taken training um, on diversity, equity, and, and inclusion mm -hmm. because I really feel I had some blind spots and, and I still have blind spots. And I know there's a lot of growth that I need to do and my my all my people took 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 the course, and so, but but I think that I'm probably because I, I have a team of, of of women that I work with, so I think that they probably have coming from a different seat, and mm -hmm. um, so I think the pendulum is, is 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 very high right now for for good reasons, but I, I think it's it's I, I think that I think. I know in some of my searches that that men are taking a back seat, um, but I think that that the client is slowing down the search process to really interview women and and, and other diverse uh, uh, people. The other thing that 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 is a little bothersome to me, mm -hmm. and, and in the medical profession and in the university profession. Um, Asians and Indians, that, 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 that's a diverse class. And my clients, what, what, what do you see? What, what, what's your view on that? Because my clients do not see Asians and, I mean, not all of my clients, but some of my clients, they, they, they're not counting them as diverse Candidates, and I think that's wrong too. These are my personal opinions too. This has nothing to do with my clients. Want to comment on that? Yes. So I've been uh, on the campus of MIT only a couple of times, and uh, even then, not for professional reason. However, <laughs> being on a campus, I identify that you know when we see you know population like that, that's probably some university is not diversity. And uh, also, how do we identify, you know, where the person coming from versus, let's say, how they look? And um, it, it, it's a large country. And for example, when I apply, and if I don't speak, 
you know, no one consider me as a minority, but actually I am with my accent. I'm from country with a 9 million population and uh, I don't have a tribe to lean on versus the other. They have organizations, they, they have company meeting. So how, you know, what tribe am I? Do I belong? I was, I'm not belong here, but I'm not belong there. Right. And uh, that's why I'm stepping forward because I know that there are a lot of people out there and I'm not only speaking in the United States, but we talk about Europe and Africa and Australia and New Zealand, that they are there at home. You know, washing dishes, that's what we're supposed to do, right? We women, we're supposed to wash the floor, wash the dishes, take care of kids, do everything and be successful in career. And even then it's not good enough. <laughs> so how do we you know, identify because yes, it, you know, some of it is not, but I know there are some sitting out there that they are true minority and not necessary from Asia or India, but other countries. And we want for these people, men and women step forward because they might have skills that no one really have seen. And for example, for me, um, I'll, if I may switch a little bit and share my story. So when I came here initially and serendipity happened, so I was invited to the United States and then later I moved here and I called one doctor in the beginning and I told her that I would like to be an oncologist here. And she told me she was from California and she told me there is no way, absolutely impossible you don't even speak appropriate English and you have an accent. So that was my very first step <laughs> learning here how to get my board certification. Mm. But, you know, right now, if I walk in the room, you know, any patient the other day I heard, oh, you know, here is glamorous doctor. But my life was not that glamorous. So I am stepping forward, you know, like you said, you know, for Asian and other countries that they probably not really minority in some extent. Right. And we also have to balance. And how do we pull forward other people? Yeah. And, and in, 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 the, in the world that I recruit for an academic technology transfer, um, it's really interesting because the, 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 um, in, 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 in the United States tech transfer, we, we were kind of, the United States was kind of the, the forefathers of this. But people in the UK have a very different approach to this. And it's more of a consultancy and that they, they do a lot of things different with industry partnerships. So I'm trying to get this is this is a different diversity thing, but I'm trying to get my clients to to sponsor visas to, to get these people from the UK. And the people in the UK are paid at a lower rate than the United States. So we can get this great talent over here to the US, but then, then it brings up a whole other issue with visas and, and with the government and visas, which brings up a whole other, you know, ball of wax. And then universities have import export controls. And then with the, the things in China and, and trade secrets. So it, it's another difficult topic to, to discuss. Mm -hmm. But, but um, well, like you said, is, you know, I recruited this, uh, uh, I guess it's a Polish American guy to Cornell University, um, and he's just not. So he came from Poland. He, he was at he was at in industry. He worked for Pfizer, and then he worked for UCLA. So he had a very nice, diverse background. I'm not saying he was great because he was Polish, but but he but he, he you know he, he's just really set the world on fire at at Weill Cornell Medical Institute in New York City, and um, you know I think his diverse background helped, and he's from Poland too, just like you. <laughs> well, uh, you know, on the other hand, I will tell you that we don't really want to bring just because it's diversity. We also want to keep qualification. And uh, a lot of times, you know, what I notice and it's a little bit with other application that, you know, if you were from certain diversity, there may be a little bit less credentials and then checking for that position. And I think, you know, we as a society right now, probably we have to give chance people, but also, you know, not to 
lower our rank. And if you require five boxes, then let's move people with the five boxes forward. <laughs> you, you, you just said something really important. So give people a chance. And that's what I'm telling my clients. I was like, you know, you need to, let's say that this position isn't, doesn't check all five boxes. How do we get an internship program? How do we get some kind of a, a, a growth path that we can take a chance and bring in these junior people and get them in a program? And I know, I know Google's done, you know, Google has all, because they have all the money in the world that they have these initiatives that they could do this that they're recruiting these diverse people and putting them into training programs and, and with the my our professional association mm -hmm. autumn they, they have a, a foundation that that that, that they're that they're giving scholarships to these underrepresented people and under and other countries to get them in the business so so that that's the other thing is how where do you where are your feeders coming from how can you yeah. start feeding this pipeline and um my, my, my daughter was um, in career services at the, 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 the vet school at Ohio State University. You talk about a, 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 a very lopsided field. I think in the vet school, I think it's like 85% women, 15% men. And so when, when they go to admissions that my daughter was on the admissions board, you know, that they have a ranking system. So if you're a male, then you get extra bonus points to get into vet school. But, but, once again, just the opposite problem we're talking about here. Yeah, and it's uh, you know very important now. We brought uh, even made made it more broad because I learned that you served in the U.S. Navy for six years, right? Mm -hmm. And you were Navy nuclear instructor. Is yeah. that correct? Yeah. yeah. So how is diversity in the Navy right now? <laughs> well, I, I, you know, when I was in, there was no women on submarines. That there were, I, I think there were very few, there were a few teachers that were women, but now they have women Navy nukes. Uh, so I don't know how long that's been going on, but probably 10 years. So I, I they are doing that. And, and um, so I, but I, I don't know those numbers, but when I was in, it was, it was zero. So it was zero, it was zero women on a nuclear submarine. And I think from an instructor standpoint, I only remember one. Yeah. And that's, uh, I wonder if that would be all changing right now because with um, last year, well, year, almost a year before the pandemic started and uh, it's almost uh, like um, uh, one of good friend of mine said the world became uh, flat and uh, it's actually true. You know, probably you and I, would not have this conversation if it wouldn't be, you know, things happen. So on one side, we are right now uniting and we are learning more about different uh, cultures and different country. You know, before World International, it was like you have first you have to get your passport and then you can say or spell word international. Right, right. <laughs> but and, and I, you're 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 one hundred percent correct because. And, and, and now things, people will accept the fact that I'm in my basement that we have over here is a ton of boxes that we have. And, and, and if, if, if your, your kid walks behind and your dog comes in, everybody accepts it nowadays. And, and, and so the, the world is, is moving at a different speed and, and things are getting done faster. And because before you'd have to well, I have to go to Kansas City and we have to meet and it's going to take three months to get out there and all these. Now it's like, you know, one Zoom meeting, we can have six people yeah. get stuff oh done tomorrow <laughs> around the world. Yeah, so yeah. yeah I, I, I agree. I, I think that people just really accept things now, too. It doesn't things don't have to be perfect. And uh, but pe people are getting a lot more stuff done. And I guess go, go buy Zoom stock, I guess, or whatever it is. That That's right. Um, I've been enjoying so much conversation with you. And we also learned so many valuable points, Glenn. And unfortunately, we come into the top of the hour. And before, we have still five minutes. And I would like to give you, if I may, permission. <laughs> we gave some advice for 
people who they're, you know, sort of at home or maybe working and who are not seen. And we want for them, for women to be seen, for some men to be seen, but also let's give maybe few tips and I'm giving you permission. <laughs> it's my show. I'm giving you permission. What the maybe three tips we can give to leaders out there? Well, I, I think I gave one, one tip, you know, get, get involved with your professional association. Um, to get more, you have to give more. Wow. And, and it looks like you're doing that too with this wonderful program. It's a very professional platform too. I'm, I'm quite impressed. So, um, yeah. you know, so you're, 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 you're giving, I'm sure you, I'm sure you receive more, more than that. Uh, one other tip that, that, that I live by, um, I live by the Pareto principle. Have you ever heard of the Pareto principle? Would you introduce all of us, please? So, so the, the Pareto principles, it, it, it's, it, it's actually called the 80, 20 rule. You've probably heard of the 80, 20 rule. Yes, so, of course. Live so, it all so. the time, day to day. <laughs> So, so I, I live by the 80, 20 rule. Uh, and so in, in business, I think I'm, well, there's not a whole lot of other tech transfer recruiters. So that's a little bit out of the water, but you know, I, but if you look at the recruiting world in general, I I'd say I'm better. My firm performs better than about 80% of the other recruiting firms out there. Um, I, I I'm a, I'm a mountain biker. I can mountain bike better than 80% of the people out there. I, I, I compete. In short track speed skating, it's a pretty narrow, narrow thing. So I'm I'm better than probably 80% of the, the speed skaters out there. <clears throat> so, but to get from that 80th percentile <clears throat> to the hundredth percentile, so to be the num to be Apollo Anton Ono, that to close that 20% gap is going to require 80% more work. And I'm yeah. not willing to put in that. Because I want to have balance in my life. So, so, so I, I, I live by, I think for the mental uh, capacity and the mental balance in my house or in, in my life, I want to have just more balance. So, so because I, I'm not focused on, on that sheer perfection, I, I, I live by the 80, 20 rule. So that was professional associations, 80, 20, um, since I'm a recruiter and I don't know how recruiters recruit oncologists, I'd never want to do a medical search. I, I will never do that in my, in my whole life. Um, but, yeah. but, but if a recruiter calls you or, or reaches out to you, just return their call, even if you're not interested, because these recruiters can, can really um, bring you Maybe. a lot of valuable things, even if, even if you're not interested. I guess those are my three right. tips. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Glenn, I will meet you in the backstage just in a couple of minutes. Time fly by so fast. Yeah. And uh, I really enjoy, and I'm sure our audience enjoys so much. So we are taking it much, much further. And I will see you just in a moment. Everyone, uh, that was Glenn Gardner is president of Gardner Innovation Search Partners. And please uh, connect and we learn so much. And with that, thank you very much for being with us on the Dr. Connect Show. Join and uh, subscribe our channel and the comments so then you can be featured also on our show. And we are super excited to have you on our journey with us. And thank you for watching and listening. And we are looking forward to seeing you in the next episode. And with that, thank you very much. And we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.